Hey, I'm Dr. Morales, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about AFib treatment. I'm going to give a broad overview on different types of AFib treatment, and I'm going to talk to you exactly the way that I talk to patients who come see me for a consultation for their AFib, exactly the same way I talk to somebody even earlier today who came for me as a new patient consultation. I'm going to talk to you about timing for treatments for AFib, talk about a variety of treatment options from medications to procedures as well as lifestyle modifications. And in the end, I'm actually going to talk about what strategy I think actually would work the best right now for the grand majority of people. So let's first talk about timing for AFib treatment because that actually does really play a role. Uh, like anything in medicine, the earlier you catch something, the earlier you treat it, the better the success is going to be. So if you ultimately want to deal with less AFib or get rid of it as much as possible, the earlier the treatment is, the better. In addition, AFib is a disease that progresses. And so when you're at a stage what's called paroxysmal AFib, where it comes and goes, and you're not in AFib all the time, uh, that is an earlier stage of AFib, and it, you have a higher success rate with management and treatment. AFib will inherently progress and get worse and worse as the years go by. And as it gets worse and worse, it actually makes changes to your actual overall heart tissue and the overall stru structure of your heart. Uh, as people get more and more episodes of atrial fibrillation, the left atrium particularly, where is where most AFib come from, actually changes over time. It has built up of scar tissue, it's kind of a simple way to describe it, but fibrosis would be the medical term. And the more and more people have AFib, the more fibrosis is in that uh, left upper chamber of the heart and the harder it is to actually get rid of AFib. In addition, the more the people have AFib, the bigger that chamber becomes, that left atrium becomes very dilated, much bigger than, than normal. I mean, I can look at some heart ultrasounds and say, oh, that person probably had AFib for a very long time just by looking at the size of, of this, these chambers of, of the heart. And so definitely timing is absolutely crucial. Uh, there have actually been some studies when they looked at uh, procedures for AFib called an ablation, uh, where it showed that people who ha got an ablation is performed as early as possible, usually within the first year after diagnosis, you usually have better successes and have better long-term outcomes. So definitely timing is super important. Uh, the earlier you get, you get evaluation, the earlier you get evaluated by an electrophysiologist, an AFib expert, uh, as well as get serious about tre treatment options, whether that's medications, procedure, lifestyle modifications, any of those, the better your results are gonna, are gonna be. So timing, timing is certainly important, okay? So when it comes to actually treating AFib, how do we treat AFib? I'm gonna focus mostly on symptoms of AFib in this video. Uh, there's a separate video that I've made which talks specifically about stroke risk reduction and blood thinners, and I'll put a link underneath this video if you wanna learn more about stroke risk reduction and blood thinners. But let's talk mostly about symptoms of, of AFib and how do we reduce symptoms of AFib. First of all, medications are always an option. Uh, you know, I always tell you I don't want people to feel like they are forced that they have to go one direction or another direction you know in general there's a lot of things to factor in in terms of what's the best treatment option for somebody um, whether that's their overall health their overall preference for care how far advanced their AFib is and these are all things that need to be factored in to find the ideal treatment option but again medications are always an option and there's a variety of treatment options by far the grand majority of the time the most common starting first medication will be beta blocker medications. Beta blocker medications, some of the most commonly ones used would be atenolol, carvedilol, uh, metoprolol. Uh, those are very commonly used uh, beta blockers in the same categories. They do work. They are certainly helpful. Um, they help reduce the heart rate if you get episodes of AFib. They also help reduce extra beats that you have uh, for AFib as, as well. So they certainly can be helpful, um, they, but they're, and they don't really have much long-term use side effects, which is another common reason why it's uh, commonly used, but it's only one of many treatment options. You know, a lot of times patients get started on these medications and they're either not tolerating them or it's not working, and so there are definitely significant other uh, treatment options, okay? Uh, other treatment options that work a little bit similar to beta blockers, but in a different category would be calcium channel blockers. They actually work towards uh, calcium channels instead of the beta blockers, which more towards uh, uh, adrenergic receptors. Uh, they work slightly different, but they still also slow your heart rate down, reduce extra beats, uh, probably similar efficacy rate to the beta blocker categories. Uh, so, but other than them are usually very common starting medications, okay? But let's say if, if none of those work, you know, what are other treatment options, okay? When the more simple medication or more straightforward beginning medications don't work, usually there's a conversation needs to be made, made about a more aggressive, what I call AFib medication, but the more ca categorized as antiarrhythmic medication. These are medications that are a little bit stronger than, than 
beta blockers or calcium channel blockers to uh, suppress and, and prevent the AFib, but they have a lot more restrictions, which is why they're not usually started uh, right away. Um, they have a little bit of restrictions where they can actually cause more harm uh, than good when using the right and no, sorry, in the incorrect situation. And so you definitely want to make sure you're doing it in the correct patients. Um, one of the more common ones that I use is a medication called flecainide. Uh, it's a specific medication that works on the sodium channels in the heart. And it, can, it works overall fairly well to, re, to suppress episodes of atrial fibrillation. But with that type of medication, you know, you can't give it to people who either have a weak heart or have had a heart attack in the past. So there's, again, a lot of restrictions, and you got to make sure that you've had other tests of your heart, such as an echocardiogram or stress test, to make sure that your heart is overall okay before some of these more aggressive AFib medications are used. Another category of antiarrhythmic that I use a lot is called Sotolol. Sotolol works more on the potassium channels, which are slightly different than the other medication, flecainide. Uh, it can also help uh, work well to reduce episodes of AFib. Again, with that medication, it has restrictions. You know, you can't really use it uh, if you have um, a weak heart, for example, or have any or significant kidney uh, fu dysfunction as well. Uh, another one commonly used would, would be uh, Ticacin. I don't use that one my, too much myself. It works very similar to Sotolol, but it, it has a lot of more restrictions on it a, a, as well. And it actually is usually recommended to start in the hospital that medication because it needs to be very carefully monitored when it's started. And because of that, I don't use it very, very often. Uh, one of the, and then one of the strongest medications that's actually made is amiodarone. Amiodarone is a very strong medication. It actually works on multiple electrical channels of the heart, and it works pretty well to suppress episodes of AFib. It works better than any medication does. But of all the medications, it has the most long-term use side effects. You know, people, when they're on amiodarone for a while, they have they can get thyroid problems, eye problems, lung problems, liver problems, a lot, a lot of issues. Uh, and so it's definitely, when I use amiodarone a lot of my patients, but it's always a short-term plan. I never always tell them we're going to use this for a couple of months and then we're going to we're going to change to something else or we're going to do something else for your uh, long-term treatment option. And it's actually used quite a lot in the hospital because it is work rapidly, it works well, it's available in intravenous forms, and so it's used a lot in the hospital, but it's not the right long-term solution. Okay, so that's medications to, to suppress AFib. Like I said, the most common ones would be beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, but when they don't do enough, you need to have stronger antiarrhythmic medications, but there's a lot of uh, regulations and precautions with those types of medications. You have to be very careful and, you know, doctor or electrophysiologists like myself is usually the ones that prescribe those medications because we're very familiar with who are the right candidates for, for each individual type of, type of medication, okay? So, say medications aren't working or you decide you don't really want to take medications, you know, what else can we do? Okay, obviously the next steps would be uh, a procedures. Uh, a procedure which include a catheter ablation procedure would be the most common one that's done, and it's the one that I most commonly do for, for my patients as well. And the catheter ablation procedure, uh, it actually works better than any medication does, but it's obviously a procedure on your heart. So there's always pros and cons to doing a procedure in your heart. You know, even a catheter ablation procedure is never a 100% cure, but then obviously improving the success rate of any type of procedure goes along to getting it done early, um, lifestyle modifications, all that playing a role to if you get a catheter ablation procedure to improve the success rate. So in a catheter ablation procedure, uh, another electrophysiologist like myself would go into the groin and take a catheter that goes up to the heart and get into that left upper chamber of the heart, which is where most people's AFib comes from. The most common areas that are ablated when people get an AFib ablation is along the pulmonary veins, which is in a section in the, in the back of that left upper chamber of the heart where uh, four veins that go back from your lungs back, connect back to your heart, because that's kind of like the hotbed area where a lot most people's AFib comes from. There's a lot of nerve connections in that area, and there's a lot of area where a lot of extra beats start and, it's, and tends to go to the rest of the heart and ends up causing the episodes of, of atrial fibrillation. So in an ablation procedure, that's the most common area that gets ablated. Um, there's a couple of different um, equipments that, are, that can be used to do the ablation procedure, but the actual technique is overall fairly the same. Um, there, people may have different strategies based on how advanced somebody's a AFib is, but that area in the left upper chamber of the heart is the most common area that is ablated. And it works pretty well when done in, in the right setting. Again, like anything, the earlier you do it, the better the success rate is. So if somebody who's had AFib for many years or they've been in AFib all the time for many years, it may just be so much heart damage that not even an ablation procedure does a good enough success for them. So again, treating early is actually 
improve the success rate of the procedure as well, okay? There are other surgical ablation options as well. There's surgical ablation options, one's called a mini may surgery where a heart surgeon does it, not an electrophysiologist where they actually create multiple incisions and burn from the outer uh, chamber, outer surface of the, of the left upper chamber of the heart. There's also some hybrid procedures as well, which does a mix between a mini maze and a traditional catheter ablation procedure. These other procedures are actually, of course, more aggressive than a traditional catheter ablation procedure. And so uh, they can work better in some settings. Um, and for some people who have more advanced AFib, it might actually be a, a better option for them. But everything has its pros and cons. It's how they, they're more aggressive procedures and the risk would be higher than a traditional catheter ablation procedure. And if you want to learn, know more about catheter ablation procedures, know a little bit more details about the procedure itself, uh, there will be a link underneath this video where, uh, to a video where I discuss more about uh, catheter ablation procedures as well. So there's links to articles on my, on my blog. Okay? So ablation procedures, uh, procedures are always an option. They actually work better than most medications that most younger patients that I get are more likely to want to do an, an ablation procedure because they don't want to deal with the medications or medication side effects and they know that an ablation procedure will give them better results and as well as better long-term results than, than any medi medication will. So ablation procedures can be certainly be a good option. A third option is of course lifestyle modification. You know the most common risk factor for getting AFib are obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, alcohol abuse. I mean, all these things play a huge role in the development of AFib and why most people get a AFib. Now, obviously, there's going to be people who comment and say, oh, I'm super healthy and I still got AFib. Yes, that does happen to people who don't have all those traditional risk factors, but the grand majority of the people will have those uh, traditional risk factors. And so lifestyle modifications, including losing weight, uh, removing artificial ingredients and processed foods as much as, as possible, uh, re uh, reducing added sugar, redu uh, reducing sodium kind as much as possible, reducing alcohol consumption, uh, treating sleep apnea, all these things that involve lifestyles can make a huge significant component in a person's atrial fibrillation uh, as well. And for, in some cases, can do even a better job than uh, medications or, or procedures can. So they, lifestyle modifications certainly play a role. And I actually feel that that's the part that is untreated or unemphasized un, un for a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation. A lot of people, when they see a doctor or an AFib specialist, are given, here's your medication or here's your procedure, and that's kind of like their only option that they're really given. And so but I do like to make an emphasis to, to my patients for lifestyle modifications because they can make a significant component and of improvement for people with their AFib. And that's sort of why I created the Take Control of AFib program. It's a step-by-step -step plan to give everything that you need lifestyle-wise that can improve AFib is all in one place to help people get results as, as quickly as possible. And there'll be a link underneath the video for that uh, for that as well. So those are lifestyle modifications. Again, these are all treatment options. But what do I think works the best? And what how if I had a patient, if you were coming to see me in my office, what would I tell you? What probably works the best these days? Well, it's actually a combination of, of everything. You know, people sometimes feel that like, okay, I got to go one way. I only want to do natural treatments. Okay, I want a surgery and, and that's it. And I want to get rid of it. You know, and and they don't really realize that a hybrid approach where you take the best of every of all these worlds. Is probably what's going to give you the best results. The results is what you really want. The results that will last long term. And so, a hybrid approach where you combine everything as best as possible is what I really think gives the best uh, uh, best results. And that's what I counsel to my patients as well. So, it may even long term you may need a little bit of medication. Sometimes people need uh, ablation procedures to get really good control of it. And then long term, long term, getting to the source of what caused AFib, which includes lifestyle modifications and losing weight and all the things I just talked about are an extremely essential component of that long term success rate for, for treatment options. So people who are willing to take a bit of everything and, and, and take things into their own hand and take all the advice from the doctor as, as well as lifestyle modifications really in general are the ones that get the, the best, best results. You know, I've had plenty of patients who only want to treat things naturally and then they're missing out. You know, their 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 AFib is not well controlled because they don't really want to go down the road of traditional treatment. Then there's obviously people who do traditional treatment or traditional surgeries, and then they're not doing any of the emphasis of lifestyle modifications. And again, they're not getting the optimal results that they want. So people who actually take a hybrid of everything uh, uh, are the ones that end up getting the best results. And again, that's why I created the Take Control of AFib program. And it gives you the step-by-step -step guide for everything lifestyle-wise uh, that can complement what your doctor is doing at home. It can complement your 
doctor's medications or even procedures you do. And it helps you give you a step-by-step -step guide for everything lifestyle-wise that can help improve AFib as quickly as possible. Okay, so right underneath this video, there'll be a link to, to learn more about my Take Control AFib program. If you learn more about what's included in this, in this online program, you also get to see testimonial videos of uh, people who have actually signed up for the program and see what they have to say about the program. And otherwise, I wish you the best for your AFib treatment.